Welcome back to AP Quarantine Lit. Um, we thought since we get to hear our dogs all the time, you get to see one of them. This is Jer Bear over here, short for Jeremy Bear Me. Um, so we're gonna go over the topic from Friday and then show you some of our outlines with our reasoning traced. Um, again, as a reminder, the prompt was in his 2004 novel, Magic Seeds, B.S. Naipaul writes, it is wrong to have an ideal view of the world. That's where the mischief starts. That's where everything starts unraveling. So select a novel, play, or epic poem in which a character holds an ideal view of the world. Then write an essay in which you analyze the character's idealism and its positive or negative consequences. Explain how the author's portrayal of this idealism illuminates the meaning of the work as a whole. Alright, so I'm going to use the intro I wrote about the Brothers Karamazov. And I'm going to show a little outline of Faulkner's Sound and the Fury. All right, to make this work, I had to write really small. I'm going to try my best to read my writing to you. Um, what I found as I went through this is that I wanted to use the same colors just to keep in mind what part of the essay was doing what. And I found that most of the things I wanted to talk about were actually already outlined in my introduction. So I made notes over on the side for each one. The one thing that I found that I didn't talk about much was <clears throat> contrasting Alyosha as a character with his brother Ivan and the way that they set off the two big idealistic conflicts, the one big idealistic conflict and the two positions on it in the novel, the, the idea of faith versus doubt, uh, or in other words, like reason and logic versus having faith in God and in other people. And I wanted to talk about that because that's a pretty important contrast the author sets up intentionally throughout the book. So up at the top, I started with the first thing I would go into is that Alyosha doesn't have a very ideal life. It's very 1880s Russian where uh, his father is drunk all the time and is just a terrible human being. Uh, he has half siblings. He does not have a mother. Uh, he, he did have a mother, but she's now dead. He's now uh, working more or less in a monastery with a man who is also about to die. Uh, so he's really, he hasn't got a very great life. Um, and he has this brother, Ivan, who is opposite from him in every possible way. Ivan is uh, into moral philosophy and arguing and coming up with the best logical understanding of the world. And that leads him to a very different conclusion about life than Alyosha has, which is that the job of life is to uh, be faithful to God and to other people. Whereas Ivan thinks that your job is to reason your way through morality and then do the things that logic tells you to do, and that that doesn't include faith in God. So from there, I went down to some examples of uh, how people are drawn to Alyosha. So people seek him out, and it uses, the book uses the phrase he, that he travels by the back roads, meaning that he kind of wanders into situations that he doesn't expect and that leave people in a vulnerable state where they're willing to open up to him. And this happens again and again. And his peacemaking ability is so strong that he actually has his brother send him to break off his brother's engagement. And in the process, he's able to mostly reconcile his family. Uh, it, it's not entirely possible because his father, as mentioned before, is absolutely drunk and crazy through most of the, the novel in which he is alive. Um, and then he finds his brother's fiance with Ivan, his other brother, and finds that they're in love and actually encourages them to uh, be together because that will make them happy. So, and in fact, it, it would, but his brother refuses to, to accept that and acknowledge that. Um, the, the closest he comes to losing this faith is when Father Zosima, who is sort of his mentor, dies. And everyone in the monastery expects that there's going to be some miracle around the body that just doesn't happen. And that causes Alyosha to lose his faith uh, for a time. But he, he ends up helping Grishenko, which is the part in yellow here I'll get to next. And that, that gives him enough confidence uh, about his view of the world that that night he has a dream about Father Zosima telling him that he helped Grishenka and that restores his faith. Uh, and that sort of leads him back to the path that he started on. And then, so the Grishenka part is, it's a very strange source of connection because he's very innocent and naive in many ways, and she's this worldly woman. Uh, and the thing that she does that's nice for him is not seducing him, which seems like a very, yeah, it's a very basic, like, maybe you shouldn't do that. But that act of kindness um, in encourages him to open up to her. And then she starts telling about this other small act of kindness that that made an impact on her. And it's a story about an onion where someone gave her an onion. And it, it, again, it doesn't sound like anything important, but it 
becomes a touchstone in her life that when she's when she's lost, she can think back to at least someone cared enough about me to give me an onion this one time, and so I must have value and worth. And and that one thing makes an impression on her and changes her life. And she goes from being focused on just making money and being this kind of cold person who wants men to fall in love with her to being uh, a, a, able to admit that she's in love with uh, Alyosha's other brother and uh, to become kinder in the process. And so then we get to the end of the book, which is the part I have here in black, which is um, even though a lot of people die and I'm skipping over the whole court case and wrongful imprisonment and a whole lot of details that are very important. But again, this isn't plot summary. It's meant to focus on analyzing the, the main um, idealism in the book. And it ends with optimism. So Alyosha is at a funeral because, again, a lot of people die in Russian novels. <laughs> and his friend uh, that he's giving the speech for is someone that he loved and spent a lot of time with. And in this funeral speech, he tells the people there that they need to seek love and connection and what really matters. And that's how the book ends with the boys kind of cheering for this idea. And that's the clearest picture you get of how Dostoevsky is giving you his ideology that like, when the world falls apart, you have faith and you have human connection, and that's what gets you through. Um, and then I hear I would bring back to this idea of Ivan, which again, I didn't, when I was outlining this, it didn't occur to me until really the very end, which is why I kind of outline in, in paragraph form. It's, these aren't really paragraphs, but this is where I would build my paragraph from with more specific information about each of the examples. But here I would come back to Ivan. I really like ending an essay the way I start it. So if I bring up something in the first paragraph, I always wanna come back to it at the end. Um, but Ivan is is the exact opposite, where he he's incredibly unhappy in his life. And Dostoevsky is giving us this picture of, of Ivan and Alyosha together and saying, who's happier? Who's, whose idea is right? Who's the one at the end who is happy and connected with people, even though a lot of things around him have been unraveling? And the answer clearly is Alyosha. Ivan uh, ends up feeling morally responsible for the murder of his father. Again, long story. It's a very long novel. And ends up going mad. And he has Katerina, his brother's ex fiance with him at the end. And there's this note of optimism that maybe he can recover and be redeemed. But his, uh, his doubt, his skepticism has led him to this mental breakdown. And so Dostoevsky is giving these, these two pictures. This one happy person and this one miserable um, mentally ill person at the end who can't recover from this loss, and he's saying, "Which which one? Which one do you want to be? Which one is right?" And giving you a very clear Alyosha is the path that you want to follow. All right. So I'm as I was listening to Cheryl talk about um, about the brothers Karamazov. I said that right. Karamazov. Karamazov. Sure. Okay. Um, I realized how much the sound and the fury. While it's also a book about a family collapsing in on itself, um, has is a, is a stark contrast to the um, to the way that that, that book ends up. Um, um, Jason Compson, the youngest son of the Compson family, his idealism, his ideal world is um, that he can control everything and thus make everything right in the world. Um, which causes his whole world to fall apart, which is almost a perfect inverse mm -hmm. to what you just said Alyosha was doing. Um, and just a really quick note on the screen, you have up here, oh, that's moving it. Up here, you have your intro from the last video, mm -hmm. your outline, and then this is your conclusion, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and that's a, and those are both, you know, bones of them. They're not like the full thing written out, but, um, that's the general gist of it. So, as a as a reminder, the Faulkner is saying as as a part of a thesis that um, Jason wants to control everything. That's his ideal world, right? And that the more he tries to control things, the more they fall apart. So, within the essay up here, um, I just provided some examples of him trying to control from. From the the last chapter of of the book, um, and and then you'll see. Let me grab this right quick. You see, yeah. there. Okay, you'll see. Like, so I have like example, and then like this is 
not plot summary, but just enough to make sure that the reader is on the same page I am. And then all of them have like the connection back to the thesis. Like I, I want to be really explicit about that in each paragraph to connect it back to the thesis. Um, so the, the examples that I chose, there are many, there are many more, but um, the two that I picked is Jason trying to con chase his niece um, who is um, sleeping around with lots and lots of people. We It's one of those things that's kind of implied through that whole chapter um, that nobody really wants to admit, but it seems fairly obvious. Um, finally, she runs off with a guy, like a circus performer guy, and they go to like a barn like miles away in the countryside, and he chases them in a car, and they notice that... They, they they figure out that he's following them and they hide and circle around behind him and then slit the tires in his car and drive off and leave cool. him leave him stranded there in the countryside um and is a perfect example of how how terrible a person he is that you you're reading this and you're thinking good punk right like it's, i don't know he's he's just a terrible terrible person um so but anyway, his, his attempt to control his niece leads to him being stranded. Um, and and she does what she was going to do anyway. I mean, and it leads it to a tremendous amount of anger for him, too, obviously, because he's stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And th this is, you know, 1920s, so we're not talking, we don't have cell phones or can't, like, you know, call somebody. So he's walking a long distance back to town. Um, so it's, that's that's an exa one example of, of like, him trying to control everything that she does, like he snaps because she's been skipping school and doing all kinds of stuff. It sounds like a pretty good example because when when an author controls your emotional reaction to something so effectively, like you're thinking, oh good, this person is getting what they deserve, it gives you a pretty good insight into what the author wants you to get from that section. Yeah. Um, then in the next one, we find out throughout this chapter also um, this is the one, the last one, the one that's narrated from Jason's point of view. Um, it's not the last, last one. It's the next last one, I guess. Sorry. Um, but we find out that he is, has been, st his older sister, the, the niece that he chased, um, is the daughter of his older sister. And his older sister has been cast out of the family for whoring around, basically, when she was about the same age as, as Quentin, um, the niece. And... So she, but Caddy, the sister, has been sending money to her mom, to the family, um, for 17 years to pay for like Quentin's schooling and for her food and that kind of thing. Um, and Jason has been stealing it and, um, using it to play stock market basically and to support his, um, illicit lover in Memphis. I mean, going up there to see her from Alabama. So, or Mississippi, sorry, Mississippi. And so he's stealing the money. He's st stolen, we find out by the end, like nearly $50,000 from her. And then somebody finally steals it from him. Um, he also, w one, in one of the most jarring scenes of the book, he comes back after back to town after chasing Quentin through the countryside and getting his tires cut and having to walk back. And then he goes back to like, I guess you'd call it the stock office, like the trading post, I guess, where, where the, where they would telegram, telegraph, telegram, telegraph in the, the news from, from New York. So they you know how the stock prices or whatever. Telegraph is the verb. Telegram is the noun. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Um, where the information would be coming in and he had told them like to contact him if there's like news good or bad news so he knows where to put his money and they had been trying to contact him but he was stuck out in the country uh, with no way to contact him and he comes in there and screams at all of them mm -hmm. because they didn't contact him even though there was no way to contact him um that kind of thing is is perfect is a perfect example of what kind of person he is and how he wants to control everything even though he can't mm -hmm. Um, and he loses all of his money. He loses all of his sister's money. He loses all of the family's money and the family's like collapsing in on itself by the end of the novel. Um, so uh, this is, uh, is a roundabout way. It's kind of like Faulkner's book. It's very roundabout. Um, in, in conclusion though, so I'm coming back over there now. Um, so he uses the, Faulkner uses the, 
the Compson family generally and Jason specifically um, kind of as a parable, right? He's warning us of the danger of of a web of generational lies because nobody's really telling the truth. The mom's not really telling the truth. Um, Jason's not telling the truth. The sister's not telling the truth. Quentin's the, do- the niece is not really telling the truth. But it's all papered over by, I guess you'd call it a web of Southern gentility where they're all pretending that they trust each other, but none of them really do. Um, and and that that web causes the the world their world to collapse by the end of the novel and i mean basically all of them want to be in control but in the end none of them mm. are um i mean so, so, i mean i could have written this about the idealism of any of the family members but i chose him because he's a jerk and and jerks are more fun to write about yeah. I think it's a good reminder, too, that however the characters end the novel is usually a message from the author about what he he or she wants you to get from it. So the characters that are, you know, crazy and um, often uh, insane asylum because they their own morality has driven them crazy, that's trying to tell you something about that morality in the mm-hmm. same way that the characters who end up, you know, I, I mean, like in Gatsby, spoiler alert, um, Gatsby ends up dead. And that's supposed to be a pretty clear indictment of everything that he's done through his life and everything that he's strived to do. Yeah, don't be that guy. Right? So, so if that's helpful. Um, so I guess we will be back tomorrow with a f- renewed focus on the prose passage because that is what your AP exam will be. If you hadn't heard the news, that is, uh, that is the passage that they chose, the, the second one where they give you a, a prose prompt and then you respond to it. So we will be turning our focus to that. So... Keep reading. Uh, Stay inside. Wash your hands. Stay safe. Mm -hmm. Wear a mask now. Yeah, wear a mask. And we'll see you tomorrow.